of a three-part series on this topic. And if you couldn't make the other two we've held, we recorded them so that you can view them later on if you wish to. We're glad that you can join us today and look forward to spending time with you. So we're webcasting to you from Seattle, Washington, and Portland, Oregon from the LEARNS project. LEARNS is the Corporation for National and Community Services Training and Technical Assistance Provider for youth serving programs. Uh, my name is Eric Stiebotter. You've been getting emails from me and uh, perhaps a phone call. And I'm glad to be with you. A little bit about me, and then I'll let our main presenter, Jin Lin Wu, introduce herself, and then we'll, we'll get started with the material. I am a former VISTA member and recruiter for the Corporation for National and Community Service. After I worked on behalf of VISTA and the corporation, I went on to do training and some education consulting before returning here to Portland, Oregon to join the LEARNS team where I developed face-to-face -face and online trainings for tutoring, mentoring, and out-of-school time programs. Jen, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, and aloha, bienvenidos, and welcome. Um, I'm broadcasting again from my bedroom, which has the best, best soundproofing in my house, and we're in Seattle, and we're really happy uh, that you've all made the time to join us. In terms of experience, lots of different kinds of experience, but just a few things that are relevant to this particular conversation. I've taught preschool all the way to university, so I've taught at every grade level. And as well, for over eight years, I oversaw the diversity inclusion training for the Corporation for National Community Service funded programs. So all the grantees of the corporation, we tried to provide training and technical assistance related to diversity and inclusion. As well, just over the years, I've, I'm sure that I've designed more than 100 workshops related to the topics that we have for today. So I'm just really happy to uh, be presenting as well as facilitating this conversation. Back to you, Eric. Okay. Thanks, Jen. And we should mention up front that uh, we've designed this webinar for staff of, staff of youth serving national service programs. but that being said, I think if you work for a program that does uh, that serves other population besides youth, I think you'll find something valuable. And, and certainly, this isn't just for national service programs. We we do training of all sorts of organizations within the national service community and and outside of it. So wherever you come from and whatever you're doing, we we welcome you and we encourage you to participate in our conversation today. So on slide three. We have just a few housekeeping items we'd like to attend to to make this webinar as uh, efficient and uh, enjoyable for folks. Um, we'd actually, we, as I was mentioning this before, we can actually mute everyone's phones, but we'd like to not do that because we'd like to have some uh, rich discussion among the folks that are with us today. I would ask you to, if you can, mute your own phone. So if you have a mute button, on your phone or a mic button, you can use that. Uh, don't use your hold button or we'll get to hear your choice of uh, hold music. You can also use star six and that will mute your phone from within our phone system. Um, so star six will be a mute option for you. Just don't forget to unmute yourself uh, if you'd like to speak. So we're going to be making use of a few tools within our WebEx application. Um, as I said, we'll try to invite uh, verbal comments and questions where we can, but we'd also like to use a couple of features within WebEx, one of which is the raise hand icon, which I'm pointing to on our slide image right now, but actually appears somewhere over here underneath your participant list. You should see a little button that looks like a hand. So that's one way to let us to let Jin and us here in Portland know that you have a question or would like to share something. And let's just practice with that real quick. So if you could click the raise hand button if you have a relatively nice weather right now, what you would consider good weather, raise your hand. Okay, good. We're seeing a good batch of hands up. Okay, now if you could go ahead and click that raise hand button again to lower your hand. 
And for those of you that uh, are experiencing what you would consider relatively bad weather or poor weather, go ahead and raise your hand by clicking the raise hand button. Okay. Just a handful. Yeah, we're, I don't know, we're supposed to have a nice day today, but it's looking a little sketchy so far. Great. Thank you, everyone. Go ahead and click the raise hand button again to lower your hands. In addition to that, you can also, you can also send a chat um, to us as the host um, and also to the presenter, which is Jin. So use either of those two things if during the course of the presentation you'd like to share something or if you have a question. We also may be making use of our, or we have one activity at least, where we'll make use of our annotation tools, which is, a, I'm pointing to them right now on the slide, but it's a series of tools at the top of your screen that resemble buttons you might see in Word or Excel, and these are just tools that will let you mark up the screen. So you're actually going to find them, I'm just drawing a little arrow, kind of in the upper right-hand corner of the slide window. So. Just one final thing, we will be sending out uh, an evaluation after this webinar. Actually, it should hopefully appear as soon as you are disconnected from our presentation. So please take a few minutes to fill that out. Um, this is the culminating webinar of our three-part series, and we'd like to know how we did with them because we would uh, like to consider perhaps offering it again or certainly we'll be offering other webinars in the future and just want to make that they're, they're useful to, and productive for you. So are there any questions about housekeeping or about the session in general before we get started? Okay. Hearing and seeing none, I think we'll go ahead and dive right in. So I will turn it back over to Jen. Thank you, Eric. So what you have in front of you is um, a series roadmap. So we have had three, well, this will be our third session. And you'll notice that the conversation that started off our series was laying the foundation, the second one, assessing the climate and soil, and today's conversation is all about training staff and volunteers. As Eric has said, they're recorded, they're there for you to access in the future, and besides the PowerPoint and the recording, each time we tried to provide you some links to good web resources and also some handouts. So Hopefully a number of you had a chance to download the handout um, packet for today's conversation. If not, it'll still work. But we tried to provide you, especially this session, a number of, of really strong handouts that you can use right away in your training um, opportunities. So we use the metaphor of growing for this whole series and just want to reiterate the importance of it not being something that's on a checklist that happens at one time, but really if we are really committed to facilitating a culturally welcoming and validating programs, that it is an ongoing activity and really requires that kind of commitment. So hopefully we've supplied you with some materials and conversation to support that. In looking at today, we put before ourselves a couple of goals that we thought would be helpful in thinking about training for staff and volunteers. One aspect is around using this time to provide a uh, conceptual framework to think about staff and volunteer training. And the other is to really give you some concrete strategies and resources. So we went both ways. We went so a, a few heady philosophical things about what, what to think about as you put together your training. And then on the other end of it, some very concrete strategies and resources that hopefully will help you do the work. Are there other expectations or goals that folks had related to training and um, volunteers and, and staff. We did send out a, an email beforehand and we really appreciate the three of you that were able to make the time to respond to the conversation about what are the plus minuses and interesting related to training, but this whole hour will be devoted to thinking about training around cultural diversity and inclusion. So to have any other needs that you'd like to flag, please use it or just uh, raise your hand. Is that how it works, Eric? They raise their hands and then we can unmute them? Yeah. Um, so if you if there's anything else you were hoping that we might cover in this session, go ahead and offer that up. You can just 
mention it right now. You might need to unmute your phones, or you can type it into the chat pane or raise your hand. We are getting a little bit of background noise, some beeping. So if you are in a place where you're going to have a lot of background noise, we'd ask you to mute your phone if you can. Um, we'd like to try to avoid muting everyone if we can do that. So any, um, any additional expectations? And uh, as Jen mentioned, we did receive some feedback on our email question, and we'd like to address some of that uh, in our question and answer session. So we will, for those three people that sent in that in those those uh, questions, we will uh, try to cover them in a little bit more depth in our towards the end of the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Well, then let's go ahead and get. Oh, here we go. To a welcome back. Yes. Yes, so Jue was asking how staff, and vol staff, volunteers, and mentors can be more culturally inclusive when they are spending one-on-one -on -one time with the child. Yes, that will be great. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me let me um, hold that and try to weave it in. I think some of the things that we have will will help answer it. Okay. And Eric, keep bringing me back to that question. Okay, if I haven't. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, as we to start this series, we wanted to start um, by just focusing on the question of, so what have we learned about training staff and volunteers around uh, cultural inclusion and diversity? You know, the, this is a whiteboard opportunity, but just thinking about the community that's convened on the webinar today, what are some of the things that we've learned specifically about training on this topic? Not so much training in general, but related to working with your staff and volunteers on cultural diversity and inclusion, what are some ahas or some wisdom or lessons learned that we've, we've gathered that we might offer up to the community? Thanks, Jen. And I've opened up a whiteboard now where if folks like, you can use the text tool, text annotation tool at the top of your screen to type something in. So that's the tool that looks like the letter T. You just click on it and then you can start typing something in answer to that question or uh, feel free to type something in chat or just uh, offer something up uh, verbally. Anyone? And uh, or maybe it's um, if you're new to this work maybe it's something you learned from the last couple of webinars that we've had, if you've been able to participate. Okay, so someone had typed talk, talk about diversity. Uh, don't pretend, oh, looks like can't quite finish that. Can't quite see it all on the screen. Okay, and you're starting to see others appear on your screens as well. In fact, there's no way to prevent it from being on top of... <laughs> no, unfortunately not. Okay. Okay. I want to just go ahead and, and acknowledge the ones that have been put up there. Understanding a culture is not the same as accepting a young person. It's not one a one-time thing, and it requires a whole organizational commitment. You need to get them to reflect on their personal experiences. Training begins with self-examination. There's a sharing of stories. The topic is so important, so broad, and so deep. Talk about diversity, not pretend to do it. Uh, pretend it doesn't exist. People aren't necessarily honest. They say they are comfortable. They say what they say that they are comfortable with. Self-care is important because difficult stuff can come up during a training. I, um, 
this is great. I want to just um, tag a couple of these that also um, touch on things that I've learned. I think it is really true that the training, oftentimes you need to be prepared for the conversation to go uh, possibly in places you didn't expect. Um, people are bringing lots of history and sometimes painful history to the conversation. And so uh, I think more than a lot of other topics for training, you need to be prepared and have skilled facilitation so that you can keep the space safe for dialogue and that um, everyone can be so honored uh, in the face of maybe great, great diversity. And I just point out, Jen, uh, Paul Holloway actually posted in chat an additional comment about learning to deal with those that go over the top with self-sensitivity about their diversity. I can see in the comments just lots of different kinds of experiences, um, witnessing and facilitating the kinds of trainings. And my hope really is, is that what we've designed for you today will build on what we've learned, but also maybe be the beginning place for uh, other opportunities to, to maybe join in a blog so that we can learn from each other. Um, really, what I've tried to showcase today is been gifted to me by other people and learned through being in trainings and we just keep practicing and we keep trying and we keep learning about the work. So I want to thank you for that. And Eric, will we keep a running record of all the comments and that also gets put into the record? So this whiteboard is a part of that record? Yes, we can save all those comments. Good. Um, and I want to make sure that I keep a good pace with this and that we have some time for conversation at the end. So I'm going to um, move on from this whiteboard, but I wanted to build off of your lessons learned as well as you know, let you know that I tried to do the same. I tried to grab things that I'd learned to, to um, design this particular session. In terms of the agenda, I came up with three kind of major headings that I thought would be practical and useful. So one is around seeding a framework and philosophy. I think that uh, oh, we try to be very intentional with our training and the way we build the capacity of our staff and volunteers. Unfortunately, sometimes we're at the mercy of uh, whoever the trainer is or facilitator. And after we've done training, it doesn't necessarily manifest itself in behavior in the program or in the classroom related to validating our young people. So I thought that maybe we should look at what are we trying to build and what are we, what kinds of ideas are we building off of to design our training. The second chunk, strategies for training, is looking at three very familiar topics and really honing in on uh, how we might go deeper with them in our training. And then uh, the last third of our webinar, we sent you a packet of handouts and resources we thought you might find useful in your trainings, and we'd like to uh, showcase a couple of them and talk about how we need to stimulate awareness on an ongoing basis. So we tried to do some head stuff, we tried to do some conceptual thinking, and then also provide you some really practical tools. I think we're ready to move on to the next one. So the, so the first one is all around seeding a framework and philosophy. And um, as you design your trainings and organize them, I was just trying to think, how do we get to the place of definitely being able to see progress at our program and say, yes, indeed, we're growing our capacity to facilitate uh, culturally validating and welcoming programs. And in order to do that, for me, I, I felt that we need to identify and tag, so what's, what are the concepts that undergird what we're planning to do with training? So if you look at the next one, I, I tried to, to identify for you what I consider to be key conversations that need to happen in training. So at some place in the training with staff and volunteers, folks can need to get a handle on what is culture and the role of culture and identity to self-esteem. I mean, there needs to be those connections made in order for them to then, at the outcome of a, a training, go back to the program or classroom different. So I think that that's a key conversation. Another is um, I think it's useful to spend some time talking with staff and volunteers about the world that the youth 
that we serve live in, um, and how many of those contexts put the self-esteem of our people really at risk. So the more you become aware of the world that our young people or the target population you're working with live in, I think um, that heightens our awareness about the importance of the work that we do in our programs and our classrooms. The third conversation is around cultural validation. Concretely, what does that look like? When you're in the program and when you're in the classroom or um, in an activity, what are different ways that we as staff and volunteers can step up to culturally validate our youth? And we'll spend more extensive time on that particular conversation. And then many of you from the email and from other conversations and trainings we've had, you seeded the conversation on ally relationships and the importance of continuing to build cultural competency and awareness. So that other, both that terminology, that concept is an important one to see in trainings. Um, and we've provided you a handout. We'll go over that in a minute. But to look at the uh, culturally validating youth uh, strategies, we decided to put it in a part of it in a short poll and the other reserved for a conversation. But just looking at these ways of culturally validating our young people, I thought of five that come to mind and ask, I'm asking you at this point to um, reflect on the five that we have put up on the screen and to let us know which ones you're already using in a pretty strong way so that we have a sense of what we all are focusing on. So I'll review them real quickly. The first one has to do with um, creating opportunities for young people to feel pride by witnessing, you know, members from their own community, people that they share cultural membership with, making important contributions to community life. That's a way of validating our young people. The second one has to do with not only in the community life, but in your actual program, are all your young people across the diverse cultural memberships able to look at people who look like themselves in your activities and programs in key, key roles? The third has to do with um, the use of resources and authentic voices from the community. The third is around understanding the in-group diversity that exists, how much diversity exists within a cultural group. And the last one we put up there is about going beyond focusing on just heroes and holidays, but trying to grow some depth with our program recipients. So um, Eric's going to bring up the poll. We're going to ask you, or he'll guide you through how we'll do this. But Eric, you want to talk a little bit about it? Sure. And uh, if for whatever reason we have some folks that are on the phone but not in WebEx, um, we're actually sharing some of these uh, validation strategies on slides 10 and 11. So I've just opened up a poll uh, that asks you on this first set of five validation strategies which you've used in training staff and volunteers. So on the right-hand side of your screen, you should see a poll that's opened. Um, so just select all of the strategies that you've used in your training of staff and volunteers and then click Submit. Good. It looks like about two thirds, two thirds of folks have uh, answered the poll. Yeah, it just looks like there's a couple more people finishing up. So I think 
It looks like the vast majority of folks have submitted a uh, response to that poll. So thank you for doing that. I'm going to close it now and then share with us um, what people selected. So lots of uh, lots of people using strategies four and five, Jen. Actually, in our trial run, that, that's what our results were, too. Um, and would anybody like to just speak to your experience with it? As you can see, we're playing around with trying to make webinars as interactive as possible, and we're still learning this. But um, in terms of using four and five, since there are a number of folks who have, would anybody like to just share some of your experience with it? these particular strategies in your program. Yeah, and you can um, you can unmute your phones and share something or as before raise your hand or uh, type something in the chat pane. Maybe something uh, creative you've done for one of these strategies that you'd like to share. Did someone just uh, unmute? Would like to share something? No. Eric, this is Patty McCray. Oh, great. Hi. Um, we, I used to work with teen pregnancy prevention issues, and we did a training for practitioners around um, working with Latina and Latino uh, youth in terms of their sexuality and preg pregnancy prevention issues. And we uh, had two trainers who came to speak and they were both from different Latin American countries. And it was what was really fascinating for the audience and for me as well was that they were able to be sort of living proof that they were not lumped together as one group, that they came from very different cultures and experiences. Um, and just kind of reminding the audience that you can't say, oh, well, Hispanic kids are like this, you know, that there's all different kinds of cultures. And, and they really were able to point out that you really just need to ask your clients where they're from and what their culture is like, because you can't make any assumptions. Thank you, Patty. Uh, and that's an example of, you know, um, making really wise choices so that you not only have really strong guest speakers and resources, but by the selections you make and the voices that you include, you're already addressing you know, core issues around the diversity that lives within a community. Great example. I, um, in terms of the handout packet, we tried to include you know, resources to support all these conversations. So uh, just looking at the last one, going beyond the holidays, there are quite a few resources, and we've tried to showcase a couple of them so that it's not terrible to share heroes and holidays and a lot of more available materials um, focus on that, but to grow some depth so that the students are actually building some cultural awareness as opposed to having only very surface knowledge of it. I mean, even taking a, a, an example like a holiday and building a unit so it's not just sharing in the foods or the, the custom, but understanding some of the history that drove uh, a community to coalesce around a particular meaning or value or day. Did someone else unmute to, to share? Okay. Um, I, I think that, you know, for the most part, these are self-explanatory, but I think it's really important that you spend some time in training with staff and volunteers to go over all the different ways that you can contribute to a young per person's identity that it's not simply um, making a good selection on some of the print materials we use. It's not just um, infusing our event calendar with some of the uh, different leaders from our different communities, but there are multiple ways to get this done, and the more that we can do it, the more rich the program is. I think we're going to keep moving along if no one um, has anything to, to add to this, but I wanted to just begin to identify nine ways to culturally validate students for you to use in training and for conversation and to uh, help your staff and volunteers to get a better understanding. You'll notice that the Eric's put up the remaining four from the list that I generated, and it includes hearing the languages and, and the 
the I think the terminology the different communities use use in everyday programming. So as it becomes a normal part of your program or classroom, it sends a message to our young people that you know this is part of the community. Uh, the seventh point is around um, grabbing and honoring the things of a community and showing respect in a way that sends a message to program staff and to the young people about how important that cultural group is and how to show respect. The eighth point is around um, service learning and community involvement. I think one thing is to import things to the classroom or the program, but another validation strategy is to create opportunities within the community and across the community for our young people to serve and to connect and not only make contributions, but to begin to appreciate all the things that are going on in the community and that be an important validation strategy. Um, and then the last one I just wanted to stress that every community that continues and persists, there is great resiliency. There are lots of challenges and the whole conversation around how resilient a community is and how community copes with a lot, a lot of different things I think is an important lesson to teach our young people. So I just wanted to uh, provide you with sort of that kind of a conceptual framework. In, in thinking about designing um, outcome objectives and goals and lessons, also put together a handout that hopefully you'll find useful. And Eric, do you mind bringing up that one handout in terms of frameworks for seeding? Sure. We'll take just a second here. So uh, before we move on to hold the conversation, some of the conversation around seeding or framework, I included in your packet this table that might help some of you design some of your trainings. I think that, um, sometimes we rely on our trainers so much to bring in the knowledge and we're just not quite sure what we should be asking them to train to, what concepts, what ideas. If you're hoping to grow culturally validating and welcoming programs, to me these are some of the core concepts that, that underlie that thing. So I hope you find that useful and uh, as you proceed to design training for your staff and volunteers that you might consider um, having your trainers or yourself or your staff facilitate conversations for the team around some of these uh, conversations. I, it's really hard to, to have staff and volunteers validate and care about validating students culturally and their identities if your staff and volunteers don't have a sense of what culture is, uh, haven't been able to reflect on their own cultural awareness, their own cultural membership what it feels like to be validated, what it feels like to be invalidated. So hopefully that is helpful. I'm just trying to manage our time. And Eric, I think we have to move on to our second conversation about strategies for training. Okay. At any point, if you want to stop the process, I think the easiest would be to type in a chat question, and then uh, Eric will help me field those. Sure, or uh, press the raise hand button also. So related to strategies for training, I wanted to give, provide you some um, concrete examples of some conversations that we generally put into training, but I think we can do a better job of covering. So one is the use of ground rules. The second is screening resources for bias. And the third around modeling uh, for cultural diversity. So what we've heard a lot when we provide uh, technical assistance for observed programs is that um, even when we have taken the time to adopt ground rules, somehow we're still not using them um, in a way that really can help the group manage its own process. So I wanted to relook at the whole idea of ground rules. Ground rules and establishing them are essential to cultural inclusion and cultural respect. And so for every program, every, every classroom, you know, there should be time spent on creating a respectful and safe environment via the ground rules. My observation has been, though, a lot of our staff and volunteers 
witness us facilitating ground rules, but are not so fluid with them to know what to do with them once they've been established. And um, I wanted to tag, related to ground rules, some conversations I think you might want to go over in training with staff and volunteers. So you definitely want to stress how important they are to establishing and maintaining the safe environment. Uh, the second point uh, is to help staff and volunteers understand how they not only get developed, but maintained and adopted, and how you grow with ground rules so that they're a living covenant between the people in the circle uh, that you're in your program. Um, I think it also is useful for staff and volunteers to reflect on which ground rules really relate to cross-cultural respect and um, cultural validation and, that's an affirmation. Not all ground rules do that, and I think that the more that our staff know that, that would be better. I wanted to especially tag this next one around coaching your staff and volunteers to, to help manage the group process using ground rules. So I'm suggesting that in your staff trainings, you not only discuss ground rules, but you might even do role playing and simulations of different things gone awry in a program or in a classroom and how you would make a good intervention relating to the ground rules. Um, and then the last conversation around ground rules is some inventive creative ways uh, to teach the ground rules and to learn the ground rules. I know almost everyone on the call must be using ground rules or facilitating ground rules. I'd like to open it up to see if there's any comments or any other insights that you'd like to share related to teaching about ground rules in your staff and volunteer training. Anybody? So if folks want to unmute their phones or just uh, type something into chat. Okay, it looks like uh, Jui has uh, comments or questions. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yeah. I think okay. So when we're doing training for adults, kind of it feels like um acting with like children when you're asking them to be respectful and one person talks at one time and things like that. So the ground rules ground rules kind of sometimes feel silly when we are training adult mentors. Um any ideas on that? So you we usually just tend to not use the ground rules because you feel like oh, everyone knows that they shouldn't be turning on their cell phones. Um or I'll take a stab at it, Julie, and then I want to let anyone else add to it. I think that it, um, I have used ground rules across age groups and haven't had any problems. I, I really believe in the, their importance. I think that sometimes it might be a timing thing, and so sometimes I will offer up three or four so that I can facilitate the conversation more quickly. Mm -hmm. That might be one thing that might be um, challenging folks. The The other is that uh, I really go over and review sort of the cultural um, differences related to some of the ground rules and spend some time trying to build awareness so that people are really clear at the end of that conversation that unless we clarify and discuss and dialogue about uh, details such as ground rules, then we're not, we're not really fully understanding uh, how they can be used or how many different pictures in our heads we could be uh, holding. Okay. The thing is, I always talk about outcomes. I say that during this workshop or this event, you know, a desired outcome would be that at the end of the training we can say that it was respectful, that it was inclusive, that it was efficient in its use of time, that it engaged everyone. And mm, if, okay. Yeah, if that were to happen, then... I like that better. Uh-huh. It can only, you, you know, ground rules allow us to do that. It, it allows us to negotiate the space and make an agreement among ourselves of how to get there. Okay. I try to explain more the con. I give more contextual back background about why it's important to do. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and I've been pretty successful. Is there anyone else that wants to add to that when you've been challenged by maybe a more adult population with the ground rules? Uh, Jen, uh, Paul posted in chat. I don't know if you see it there. No, uh, I don't. Oh, okay. He wrote, to get the message across to those resisting the importance, you can role play and put them in the other person's shoes. Oh, that's a great idea. So some role reversal. Okay. 
Okay. And I think it's really appropriate to use um, sort of role playing to practice this so that your staff and volunteers can see how it can live in a space. I think it's, uh, it doesn't work as well if you just sort of have them witness you facilitating a ground rule conversation with students or young people or children and then um, you managing the oh, yeah. environment. They need to learn how to help the group manage its own processes using group ground rules. Uh, in your handouts, we've also included two um, resources. One, a worksheet that gives some sample ground rules, and you could um, use it as a template to create your own. Okay. And the second one okay. is the ground rules adoption process handout. So I just want to flag that for you that we did provide in the packet some more information on ground rules. And in the end of the webinar, I'm going to refer you on to a website where a teacher has reflected a lot on his work with ground rules and that you can uh, learn a lot from reading his reflections about that. I'm going to keep moving along in this. Um, <laughs> another training topic that I think relates to this conversation about welcoming and validating programs, and that's the whole learning around screening for bias. Um, I think it's uh, when I train my staff and volunteers, I think a lot of um, light bulbs go on when you simply walk them through a simple activity of screening materials for bias. A lot of times we have really great intention, but we're fighting, our intention is fighting the environment we're running our programs in. So to give you an example, you can be very committed to creating and supporting uh, females in your classroom as well as males in terms of um, location and occupation and going into whatever jobs that uh, they're interested in or gifts. And you may be saying that in your materials and your curriculum might be saying that, but as you scan for the visual and verbal messages that are in your, um, in your program building and in your program, um, it might not be telling the same story. It might be sending a different <coughs> So this is all about building uh, a team's awareness about how there's an intentional curriculum and there's an unintentional curriculum, and they both teach and they both send messages to our young people about what's appropriate, um, often stereotypes, sometimes misinformation, sometimes significant omissions. So I want to uh, just focus on the conversation of training for staff and volunteers around bias and around screening their programs and lessons and their materials for bias. I'd actually like to know how many of you include that kind of um, skill development in your training, and maybe we can just have people raise their hands. To my window, I don't see anything. Yeah, Jen was just asking um, if if you do some type of screening for bias in your materials, if is that something that you or in your is that training. something you provide in training for staff or volunteers? So if it is, if you could uh, just click the raise hand icon. And as Jin mentioned, uh, we have in the handouts that were sent out a couple of documents that will help with this. Uh, ten, ten steps as well as an as a example document that talks about how this kind of screening for bias is carried out. Okay, so it's like Jennifer and Paul incorporate some type of screening for bias in their training of staff and volunteers. And I just encourage you, if, if your hope is for culturally welcoming and validating programs, that this topic might be, um, if you haven't added it to your training curriculum, that you might think about that and look at some of the resources we provided. And in the more extensive bibliography, there's also other resources to support that training. The last uh, conversation, and I'll just cover that, and then we'll jump to stimulating awareness. But the last one is all around modeling. I know that this has got to be a very familiar conversation in all training for volunteers, uh, even beyond 
uh, designing culturally welcoming and validating programs or facilitating them, but I just wanted to make sure that in your training for staff and volunteers that th you revisit this conversation um, because I think more than anything, uh, staff and volunteers need to be critically aware that what they say and do speaks volumes. You know, and we've included in the handout package um, one information sheet that summarizes some of the points uh, about modeling and leading this initiative. So I just want to say, so what we've done is to really look at your training and think about the conversations of ground rules, the, the issue of modeling, and then the issue of screening for bias in your program environment. And hopefully those three chunks will serve you in your future training. Our last chunk of the webinar, as our time runs away with us, is the whole conversation about stimulating awareness. And Eric, you can go already pull up slide 17. The next one. Yeah, and let me, we're still getting a little bit of background noise, so uh, let me just remind everyone to please mute your phones by pressing the mute or mic button or star six. So, sorry, go ahead, Jen. Sure. So under the conversation of what I know is that beyond the dedicated times where you're offering your staff and volunteers training, that to, to really feed and grow this work and this commitment by the whole team, you really need to grab the opportunities that exist beyond dedicated training. So whether it's at the volunteer retreat or at staff meetings or over a brown bag lunch, um, there are opportunities to take, you know, 15 to 20 minutes and facilitate different activities and conversations that will continue to build awareness. And this, uh, the rest of our handouts really are trying to support you in that endeavor. You know, uh, we also suggest that you um, make it fun, that you recruit the whole team to, to help facilitate so that you might create a, a rotating uh, wheel that has different part, pairs of folks on the staff and volunteer team help facilitate awareness building. Uh, and, and also to um, really share with the staff that it can be so uh, much fun and enjoyable to spend time getting to know each other on lots of different levels. And also for, as program leaders, to think of ways of rewarding and recognizing people who take initiatives. So I, we're talking about the times beyond training even that you can grab that 15 or 20 minutes and continue to grow awareness. On the next slide, we actually summarize then a bunch of handouts that we included in the packet. And you'll notice that Eric circled for us two of them, and we're going to spend uh, a little bit of time just showcasing those materials. I'm sure that many of you have lots of other worksheets and handouts and information sheets you've created specifically for training staff and volunteers that um, can be used in the same manner, not just in training, but you know, over a staff meeting, just a dedicated amount of time to keep building the awareness and appreciation for all the cultural diversity that is in the community, that is in the team. Eric, would you mind bringing up sharing our name? I uh, wrote this a number of years ago, and I think uh, that a lot of folks, especially in national service, have used this activity that I call the foundation respect activity. But I believe that if we use it with our staff and volunteers, um, it has a generative component in that the excitement over sharing and uh, the information that is shared usually gets people uh, really thinking more about names and about the students' names and about um, using and calling folks by their correct names and their names of preference. So uh, I, we have up on the screen the worksheet, and I believe a number of you have have a similar activity or have seen this exact worksheet, but we're thinking that it would be interesting on this call if one or two folks wouldn't mind just reflecting on these questions and um, share a, a little bit about your name with us so that we can get a sense of, of how um, it would work. So let me tell you that as a facilitator, 
he would in, hand out worksheets to everyone and say, it's just a guide. It, you don't need to fill it out. It's not a test. There's not a right or wrong answer. And we're going to be getting ready to do some sharing and want you to share at your comfort level. But there's a lot to our names. Um, um, oftentimes, there's quite a bit of history related to it. It could be someone special to your family. Um, it could be uh, something that you're someone who loved you very much, uh, some connection or history they have that factors into your name. Many of us grew up being called lots of different nicknames. Uh, if you'd like to share that, that would be uh, wonderful. Um, many of us have shortened our names or had people shorten them. Um, we also have feelings about our names, and uh, if you'd like to share some of those feelings, that would be great, too. And during the time, and so that last question is really for the program, is I always try to create an opportunity for uh, participants to let me know the name that they would be preferred to be called. And Jen, I should uh, jump in to mention real quick that uh, folks have a scroll bar on the right side of the slide screen that they can use to scroll down. You're probably not seeing all six questions on your screen right now. So you can you can scroll down to see the rest of it. So this, it's just a sharing activity that um, is about names. And do we have any takers? Anybody this morning or afternoon be willing to just take a minute or so and share a little bit about your name as if we were in a staff or volunteer training? Well, Jen, I don't know if it's showing up in your chat panel, but uh, Carissa Dross, or Carissa Dross, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, um, typed in a couple of comments about her name. She noted that uh, Carissa is, uh, or come, derives from the word, or she thinks it derives from the word charisma. Uh, her parents called her Christy from birth, and uh, she changed it back to Carissa. Mm. And... Uh, that she also tried to get people to call her Carice, and she loves her name. So thank you, Carissa. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. And for those of you that are typing into the chat panel, you can unmute your phones, too, and uh, share with us. It looks like uh, Crystal White. This is Crystal. Hi, Crystal. Hello. Um, my name, um, actually, when um, before I was born, my mom had three choices, um, either Angel, um, Martina, or Crystal. So she said I didn't look like a Martina when I was born, and although I did look like a beautiful little angel, um, she opted to name me um, Crystal. So that's how I got my name. Um, okay. As far as nicknames go, um, I don't have a lot of people that call me by this nickname, but some people call me Chris. Okay. Um, just shorten Crystal a little bit. Um, the spelling, I think, um, gets me the most. That's the typical spelling, I think, but my name often gets spelled a lot of different ways, so um, if it's anything frustrating, that would be the <laughs> frustrating part of having my name spelled a lot of different ways. But I love my name, so Great. I wouldn't um, change it. So, Thank you, Thank you Crystal. Uh, it looks like Myrtle has her hand raised. Did you want to share a little bit about your name, Myrtle? Uh, yes. Um, I'm named for my grandmother. Um, and... Um, whom I never met, so I didn't have a relationship with her. Um, I do have nicknames, and I have several, and people usually shorten my name to either Mert or Mert Mert or some derivative of that. Um, I don't really like my name because I don't think it fits me. I don't think I look like a Myrtle because the stereotypical uh, picture of a Myrtle is probably uh, some elderly person. Uh, uh, grandmotherly type person, and so I don't like it for that reason. And um, but it's it's the only name I've ever known. So if you were going to call me by 
a name. You could still call me Myrtle, and I'll answer. <laughs> Great. Thank you. And uh, I see that uh, Paul and Melinda actually uh, offered up some some information or history about their names. I think, though, Jim, in the interest of time, uh, so we can let these busy folks uh, get back to the good work that they're doing, we might want to touch on that last um, handout. Okay. And Maybe I'm just... take some questions. So I think uh, Melinda and Paul's comments should be visible to everyone in the chat panel. So take a look at a little bit about their names. And what I'd like to end with this, this handout, which has been really successful, is that um, you know, in our trainings and our structured activities to facilitate deeper awareness and relationship building, I think, um, you know, embedded in a conversation about a name is cultural sharing. We don't have to say we're now going to share culture, but it's a really natural conversation, as are many. So talking about celebrations for my family that are meaningful, it begins to talk the story of different cultures and different backgrounds. So I think that as we think about training staff and volunteers, who will in turn work with our young people that uh, if we select well, we can weave really, really fine conversations and sharing and deeper relationship building. I also, the last thing I um, want to say about this is, uh, as you might know, with any activity, there are also possibilities for some people to come with very painful histories around their names. And so just to be aware of that, that uh, for the most part, usually when you facilitate staff trainings and include the worksheet or a staff lunch, um, it's really wonderful sharing and you get to hear each other's heart and a bit about history. But occasionally, uh, folks have a lot of painful memories associated with their names, so just be aware of that. And that's why it's so important that you have the right to pass and also that uh, people get to share at their own comfort level and they get to share what they'd like to share. So just I want to express that. You're right. I'm going to move on to the next um, handout that we wanted to showcase. So sometimes we use information sheets. And this one we grabbed from the National Service Inclusion Project around language. It's just a one-sheeter, and Eric's going to bring it up in a minute. But it just poses a question, does language matter? And it gives you an opportunity to talk about person-first language and, um, and just terminology. So we wanted to include this handout in your packet. but I hope you're getting the uh, feeling that, wow, there's just a lot of different resources that I could just grab, not just for training, but along the way in terms of this team's development. I can seed this and I can facilitate this at retreats, at meetings, at um, different kinds of venues to keep growing the awareness. And that's what we'd like to really, really support you doing. I can't believe our, our time is almost up. We wanted to also um, encourage you to freely use those packets. And if you have other ideas, I think we opened up in the past webinars opportunities for people to also forward over resources that could be sent out to everyone else. So if this has stimulated for you a bunch of ideas of, boy, I have this handout or this information sheet that other people could use, please, please um, send it along to us, and we'll make sure that it goes out to everybody who is on this call. Yes, thank you, Jen. If folks want to send to me any tools that they've found useful, I can I can certainly send them back out to folks. Okay, so we um, definitely want to open it up for any questions. Do we? Uh, for, I know that we're out of time. Eric, how should we handle this? Go to questions and answers, or or flag the resources and come back for folks who can stay on. I think the latter. Let me go ahead and move to the resource slide, which is slide 21. I'm going to ask, um, so you'll notice that there are some uh, resources that you already know of, so LEARNS, the National Service Inclusion Project, and the Resource Center if you're part of the national service community. And if you're not, you're still very welcome to access those resources. On the right-hand column, um, I've identified the Multicultural Pavilion, which is Paul Gorski and, and team site and has lots of different great uh, resources and ongoing conversations about the work. I wanted to also share with you Debbie Reese's website, American Indians and Children's Literature. She's uh, facilitated this blog for a number of years now and has been interested in really critiquing and providing a venue for us to look at materials and resources related to 
Native American communities and um, really just great resources. This is a the last one is a pretty historic resource called Beyond Heroes and Holidays, and the editor of that collection is Enid Lee, but I think you'll find that resource, if you don't know it, to be really, really invaluable. So I just want to make sure that um, these three got showcased on the far right and that you know on the far left that within um, the LEARNS project, we have lots of different resources that we hope that you'll avail yourself of. Eric, you, you want to put up your contact information, too? Sure. And yes, uh, if folks have questions or would like some resources after this session, please do feel free to contact us here at the LEARNS Project. You can give us a call or send us an email. And uh, if you have a question for Jin specifically, uh, I can certainly relay those on to her. Uh, we have a lot of good materials here as well, so we'll try to put you in touch with those where we can. I do see Jennifer Frigolette's comments in the chat about not getting the handouts. Uh, so I will resend those to you, Jennifer. Um, and anyone else, give me a, send me an email if you didn't receive them. I actually sent them out a little bit later than I usually like to. I sent them out this morning. So normally I try to be a little bit more on top of it, but I was a little behind today. So if you didn't receive the pack out, uh, packet uh, Jin's been referring to, uh, send me an email and I'll get that right out to you. Okay, so I think that will end our official presentation. Um, Jin and I are happy to stick around and talk if people want or answer some questions. And I think, Jin, we can, if, if they're able to remain with us, we should try to answer a little bit of, the, of some of the questions that the people had emailed us and then take others as people, as people are able. Um, so thank you, everyone, for coming to our webinar and uh, for coming to our others if you had a chance to. And if you didn't, feel free to uh, watch the recording of those sessions. And uh, be sure as well to complete the evaluation that should appear when you log out of WebEx. Thanks, Eric. This is Nikki. I just wanted to make sure, um, Jui, if you're still on the line, I think Jen answered your question that you posed in the beginning in some ways throughout, but I wanted to make sure that, that we address that before you sign off. Um, yes, I'm on the line, but I think I got quite many answers. Okay, okay. great. great. Just, sure. Then we'll just open it to anyone else. And if, and if Kathleen's still on, you know, Kathleen and Melinda and Laura were the three people that were able to fill out our plus minus and interesting query. And uh, if Kathleen is still on and able to stay on, I'd like to ask her to speak to us about some of her lessons learned because um, I didn't read so many questions in your comment and some really good recommendations. So Kathleen, are you still on? I'm still here, Jen. Yeah, you know, um, would you mind just talking a little bit about uh, the important role of leadership and about focusing on one ism? Um, sure. So I think um, one of the things that I wrote about was how I think kind of broadening the definition of diversity tends to allow more people to access the conversation so if they can see places where maybe they both have felt on the outside or are not included or discriminated against, um, it sometimes opens the door for them being able to see how they might also be part of a larger system that they've gotten some benefits from being um, in, the other, uh, in other groups. Um, so I think that kind of that broad view of diversity often can open up that conversation. Um, I don't know if other people have thoughts about that. I also think that, you know, the point that you said in your email around um, as we think about training staff and volunteers, how critical it is for there to be this um, everyone on board. So leadership buy-in and participation in the training really sends a message to staff and volunteers about how important the training is. And I guess maybe if I could add to that, Jen, I feel like I um, have had some really painful experiences of trying to convince supervisors that this was important. and. Looking back on it now, I could see how I didn't have a lot of tools for talking to them about it or helping them see how it was important. I think I mm -hmm. used the, I was pretty self-righteous about it. <laughs> and sorry about that. 
Um, so I don't know, Jen, if you have some thoughts you can share about, um, you know, just how slow this work often is and how to kind of just keep at it or just other thoughts you have about when you feel this is really important and the people who supervise you, you're trying to convince them how important it is as well and you're hitting barriers of roadblocks. Just any advice? I think that um, you're right. Sometimes when we try to um, facilitate people coming on board and uh, making, you know, program commitments to it, but we feel like, or we're treated like we're the um, chalk on the blackboard, or nails on the blackboard, that we start getting the look like the dreaded, you're going to bring this up again, and it's really helpful when we um, can avail ourselves of, of community trainings, we have different allies so that we're not always the messenger, you know, and so that other people are speaking, and I think it's really strong that if you can find really solid training that you ask a team of, of the leadership or the board, a cross-section of folks to go to the training with you so that people are learning a language and a framework together so that they can bring it back to the program. I think when you're trying to infuse your program with a way of looking at it and really uh, full commitment, it's really nice when you have a cross-section team that's being the driver. But that's one idea that I can think of. Um, I also didn't know if uh, Melinda, are you still on? Yes, I'm still here. Oh, you know, Melinda, you know, when you talked about um, the interesting developments around when you combine people of different cultures together in interesting ways and what was starting to happen in, in your program, can you talk? share with the rest of us a little bit about that? It was really exciting to read. Um, I'm not really sure if, um, I'm not really sure what you mean, what you want me to talk about. Oh, <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yeah, you know, under your interesting developments, you wrote that, you know, you were having the students and volunteers, you know, they're paired up and they're often from very different cultural uh, memberships. Yes. That's how that was sort of helping the students shift. Yes, you know what, it was, um, and not just the students, but we are a mentoring program. So it was really opening the eyes of um, our mentors as well, just um, being aware of, you know, the different cultures out there and just really even what's entailed of being a part of a different culture and opening their eyes to it and becoming a part of it as opposed to just looking from the outside in, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if that makes sense. So, yeah, it's been really neat to see, you know, not just when they go through the training to see that, you know, they have them hear about what they're going to experience, but then once they get to know the students and the students get to know them, how those experiences then turn into acceptance and um, becoming involved in, you know, really just encouraging and helping build the student self-esteem. I spent a lot of time designing intergenerational strategies where, uh, young people are paired with community elders on activities, um, different kinds of actions for the community, and through just pairing and repairing folks, you find so much, uh, some, so many of the barriers coming down, and some deep affection growing, and a lot of awareness about groups and people saying things like, "Golly, I used to think that all elders were like," or "I used to think, you know, all the kids that were from that neighborhood are." and they are starting to have those um, stereotypes broken down and their prejudices challenged. So I, I'm a great believer in the combining and recombining, and the more opportunities that we can present to our staff volunteers and our young people to pair and work in meaningful ways with other people, um, there's chances for them to uh, grow in their understanding and, and allyship. You know, and I would just, I just, you know, kind of on the second day because I know a lot of our mentors when they go into mentoring, we work with a lot of high risk youth and a lot of our mentors are not from the area that they go in to work with the youth at. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times they go in with their own biases and what they think is going to happen. So it's kind of neat to see when they actually begin volunteering and getting to know and building those relationships, how that changes how they view 
life and even that area and that community and what it has to offer. And it's just a really neat thing to see it happen. Well, I think that's a nice reminder that it's not just within staff training, but sometimes when we create opportunities for people to um, mix it up, uh, join in, uh, you know, explore in a different way that the, their capacity is being built in a real natural way. Any, if I don't know how many people are still on, so I, is it possible, Eric, for us just to open it up and if anyone has a question they'd like fielded? Yeah, that would be fine. Uh, Laura, as you mentioned, had a question, but I don't think she's on the line with us anymore. So, uh, yeah, anyone else like to ask or, or share some experience or tools they've had success with? You might need to uh, unmute your phone if you've had it on mute. No? Okay. Well, um, not hearing any more and not seeing any more in WebEx. I think we'll go ahead and sign off. So thanks again to Jin for presenting, and thanks again to all of you for joining us today. Uh, we hope it was helpful, and uh, do get in touch with us if there's more that we can do for you. Any? Thank you. Great. Okay, thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your week. Bye-bye.